I did not name Victor after Victor Hugo, <laughs> but um, but I do enjoy a, a lot of Victor Hugo's work. Um, have have any of you read Les Mis? Yes. The the full one. Mm -hmm. It's a great. I I wrote. I think one of my favorite papers that I ever wrote in college, based off of Les Mis. One of the things I thought about Les Mis is in the middle of it, there's a 70 page telling of the Battle of Waterloo. To set up the fact that Marius's dad, one of the characters, gets rescued by Thenardier. And it gives, as part of that, just uh, Marius's dad's military history and his rate of promotion. And so I did a paper, I was taking a class, it was a great class, on the history of warfare in Europe. And uh, Dr. Drummond, who taught it, <coughs> one of the more influential people on how I actually teach, wonderful guy. He would lecture for around 15 minute chunks, and then he would say, okay, don't, don't hold on for your questions, I will pause routinely and ask for questions. <coughs> And then we can go on from there. So don't, we'll keep the flow up. And, and if you have a question, I'll answer it then. Or if it's something that we'll get to about. And it was just incredibly organized. And the class looked at uh, not, not the individual wars and what happened, but rather how the armies fought in them and what you learned about society. I mean, what you need society to be if you have knights is different than if you've got. Uh, volunteer soldiers and if you have full mobilization. <coughs> so it was looking at, at war from that perspective. But what I did was I, I looked at um, whether or not Hugo had presented a, a realistic depiction of the way you get promoted in the full environment. So I looked at the biography of the 20 uh, men who attained the rank of general for Napoleon, because you have good histories of them. And I looked at their rate of uh, promotion, and it dovetailed perfectly. It was a precisely accurate prediction of how you might earn promotion in Napoleon's army. And I was so utterly impressed by it. Those research papers, you learn so much. You forget most of it, but you. <laughs> uh, Victor Hugo uh, was banished from France, and he. Uh, bought a house on the Isle of Jersey in the uh, English Channel, and his house was on, was on the southeast corner of the island. And he, it was a three-story house, and the top story had a lot of glass windows around, and he had a standing desk that he would write at. And on a clear day, he would just see the coastline of, of France. And he's in exile when he writes Les Mis, and there's this long section where he's just going over the streets of Paris, or even the Paris sewer system. And he's writing about places that he'll never get to see again. So it, it, he's, he's remembering. So the reason why he's going so long with that is it's an homage to where he'll never get to go again. So beautiful. Ah, the joys of great literature. But yeah, I think Victor Hugo and Dama, that's about it that I've done for French. So, oh well. Are, are you not a Victor Hugo fan, fan Maggie? Uh -huh. <laughs> Victor Hugo. Les Mis, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. Ah, the joys of life. Yes. When I think of someone who likes Victor Hugo, I think of Jerry Cruz. <laughs> now, now, Sue, okay, you brought coffee from home. I was going to say, do you want me to make up a, a thing of Folgers for you? I can do like a... a tea. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so you can do tea here too. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, now, now, now we've rambled about about random yeah. stuff enough. Yeah. Um, we are, in theory, going to be looking at Revelation chapter 18 on page 54 of the study uh, when we uh, get it going. I'll ask while he's out. Are there any questions before <laughs> Jerry gets in? If any of you want to ask a question, now is your chance. <laughs> you can elbow him out of the I heard his laugh, you better hurry. Uh, Stan Short was walking around and I, I started to prep for the class. He goes, 
Oh yeah, you've got to go prepare for Jerry tonight, don't you? No, no one can ever prepare for Jerry. I probably should behave. My my mom is in the hospital again, so she might be watching. Just getting her her oil change, the, the fluid oil off. So. If I if I get any uh, stop picking on Jerry yet, uh, yeah, I'm standing too far from the, the camera to read it, so I, I I'll ignore it. <laughs> I don't know if you do you watch on Fox News uh, the five. My mom there, does. There, there, Maybe there's that's why she's got a hair whose mom picks on him. <laughs> well, maybe my. I will tell the story. <laughs> so I am teaching Bible study at my first call. I'm a young new pastor. I've not been there but a few months, and my mom is passing through, so she comes to church, and we're doing Ephesians. And and I translated it for the Bible study, just like here. And I have on it, noting it as the PBT, the Pastor Brown Church. And my mom's like, what's the PBT? And I, I said, and she starts busting my chop in the Bible study. I can't believe you would do that. What? <laughs> mom, I'm not dad who just had 10 weeks of grief. I, I, I got a degree in classics, Mom. And no, she, oh, so. But it was the joys of, of uh, life. There are a few better ways to be prepared for being a pastor than have a mom who will bust your chop. <laughs> All right. Are there any questions about life for you, <laughs> Sam? Anything? As I look at Jerry, he smiles. Now, it, what you got? It was interesting. We went to a, a Catholic wake last fall, and uh, the priest. We happened to be in line when the priest came, and and it was time to say prayer. So, uh, you know, everybody sat down, and at the end of his prayers, he uh, we said the Lord's prayer, mm -hmm. and they they finished it like we do they did that that night and for thine is the kingdom and the power, power and the glory for mm -hmm. and ever amen and i was wondering uh, are they are they becoming more like Lutheran? Or? <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I was i was i was kind of, i was surprised depends the purpose um the the longer ending for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever that is the fancy liturgical ending so it would make sense in a ceremonial context to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you are Jerry the Roman Catholic and you've been misbehaving and, and your priest has assigned you penance and you have to say the, the Lord's Prayer ten times, what do you do? You do the, the sure, quicker one. Sure, yeah, sure. yeah. So I'm but, so that's one of the, the differences and distinctions. But there, there is the idea of having the, the fuller one at a more fancy occasion. But you can go for the quicker one if you just need to get it done. Uh, so. so that happened when? And it came to yes. your mind this week. <laughs> that, that what? <laughs> it, it came to your mind this week. That was your, your burning oh, question about how many you went yeah, to yeah. last year. <laughs> I have another one, but uh, all right. Well, the pressure well, is on about Jerry because he knows that you have to have a question every week, so you've been thinking, oh, oh I yeah. can have a question. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's always the point. All right, well, let's start. We're, gonna, we're, we're looking at the fall of Babylon, and, and Babylon as presented as the, the great, luxurious lady of the night, the, the high, priest of witch, high priestess of wickedness and all that. And she is ruined. And what we're going to see in the rest of Revelation 18 is the reaction of people to her ruin. So if someone would read, I, I know it says verses 9 and 1. It should be verses 9 and 10 of Revelation 18. And wait and lament shall the kings of the earth, the ones who prostituted and luxuriated with her, when they see the smoke of her burning. From a distance they will stand with fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour hath come your judgment. I was really struck when I was translating this, probably because it was in the uh, run-up to election and we were filled with campaigning and political promises and all that. 
And here you have the depiction of the rulers of the earth, the kings of the earth. And what have the kings done? They have participated in the wickedness. They were part of it. They were enjoying it. But when the chickens come home to roost, and punishment's being leveled on another person, what do they do? Hands off, step back. Oh, isn't that terrible? And, and really, what a fantastic depiction of what goes on with so many of the powers that be. That, that they'll be buddy-buddy when things are going good, but if, if something happens and there's a fall, then it is the standoff, oh, well, golly gee willick, there's nothing I can do about it. Oh, they too terrible. And the irony is, kings would be the people with power. So instead of using their power to, to defend, to, to protect, no, we'll just do nothing. And, and this is one of the things that I, I think is uh, interesting for when we think of when we think of the word injustice, we often think of a wrong actively being done, where where you do something that is it's not showing up on the the monitor. Let me do it this way. We, we think of, of normally doing something actively wrong. Whereas in the Old Testament, when it really talks about kings doing injustice, most of the time it's them not fulfilling justice. It's, not, it's them not enacting justice. It's not so much that it's the kings have to be wicked, it's just that the kings don't do their job. They, they, they go hands off. They let things go poorly. And that's the image here. And what happens? Oh, just some hand rain. Oh, oh, so bad. They mourn from a distance. Um, we, we, uh, what does it mean to mourn from a distance? Jerry, you were at a wake. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, what, what's the point of a wake? I, uh, the give you know your condolences to the family uh, you know recognize the individual who uh, I mean pray I mean in the Catholic I mean it's to pray right. for the for the deceased I, I, I'm trusting you're not going that far but no <laughs> <laughs> but but you get together there's a closeness one of the oddest things um, in Oklahoma they didn't do wait they didn't do any type of that. But the body would be on display at the funeral home, and you would go in and view the body and sign the book. And there was never a time where the family would be there. You would just walk in and you'd sign your name in the book. Mm -hmm. And there'd even be ads on the, 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 the radio. Oh yes, when you go and show and sign the book, that lets the family know that you care. But they never set the time for everyone actually being together. It was a, it struck me as utterly odd. It well, was very during the pandemic. That's it, it's basically been that way. Right. Uh, you know, you you read in the paper, you can go online and you can sign the book online. You know, you just never never get together with the family. And, and How does that morning that. work work when you're yeah. never actually getting together? It, it, it's it's empty. And so what, what we have here really is a, a deep and profound depiction of the powerlessness or the refusal to, to, to do justice of, of the kings, of the powerful, and also the emptiness of it, the, the shallowness of it, that, that you could mourn at a distance is not even mourning. Especially when you think about this is written in a culture where you have professional mourners. Where you would, if, if there was a funeral, you could go hire people who would come along and follow after the, the, the procession and who would wail loudly. <laughs> Let's get Jean, she knows how to cut up a rug at the funeral. She'll, she'll, she'll <laughs> mourn really. Well, no. Um, it, it's not silly. Okay. 
Yeah, well, if, if you've seen any of the, the, the videos of funerals from the, the Middle East and stuff, that, it, it's, so the idea of mourning at a distance would be one of them. And it's even, and, and it's even more just a, ah, yeah, those were the days sort of shrug and nothing. And so it, it really is a, a beautiful way, a back-end way of showing these kings as being utterly powerless and uninvolved and just, yeah, that's not all it was cracked up to be. So, any other thoughts there on those two verses? I mean, they're, they're just short, but it, it, they, they actually struck me. The powerful, those who are supposed to act as judges on the earth are powerless to stop this. They see Babylon as strong as an emblem of their strength, and it's crushed. And they stay at a distance. It is, it is a strong and a piercing critique. Let's move on to uh, 11 through 17. And the merchants of the earth wail and sorrow over her, for no one buys their wares anymore. Wares of gold and silver and precious stone and pearl and fine linen and purple cloth and silk and scarlet and all wood and ivory vessels, and costly wood and bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon and spice, and incense and myrrh and frankincense, and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and horses and chariots and souls of men, slaves. And the ripened fruit from which your soul desires have it departed from you, and all the dainties and splendors are leaving you, never to be found again. The merchants of these things, who enrich themselves off of her, off of off her. Of her, from a distance they will stand with fear of her torment, wailing and sorrowing and saying, Woe, woe, the great city, enrobed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour hath been laid to waste all this wealth. Now it's interesting because there's a little bit more honest mourning, but who from? From the merchants, from the from the, the people who realize that money makes the world go round. And you have this fantastic list of all these luxury items, all this, all this stuff. And what's the problem? Well, where are they? They're stuck in the warehouses. We're not selling anything. If the economy is tanking. And why do they mourn? Look at all this wealth. It, it's been laid to waste. Not only the destruction there, but it's not being sold. No one's using it. And so they have that that uh it, it, it's fascinating. You have this image of people who are profiteering off of wickedness. That's the idea. That wickedness was consuming all these luxury goods. I saw a thing on CNN, I, I hit the CNN website, I didn't, don't know why I did, but they had a little link for a story about a rapper who had a, a $24 million diamond embedded in his forehead. Good for him. <laughs> Looked like he had this big diamond shaped bruise in the middle of his forehead. But we, we were visiting Norman one time when Victor was toddler around Yay High, and the uh, corner of the table in there was also Yay High, <laughs> and, and he had the biggest goose egg right, right here. It's like, why did you work three inches taller? That would hit your eye, baby. But, I mean, he ran to it full pace. I, I got some Brahms ice cream to comfort him. So. But, um, that's what it looked like. What a stupid way to use wealth. But if you're the diamond merchant selling that diamond, it's a good thing. Now, now that all gets cut off here. The, that, that gravy train of wickedness gets cut off, and the merchants are, are panicked. How dare they buy up GameStop stock and don't sell? Oh. We get this. What happens when, when, the, when, when the, uh, the makers of money see their wealth and their, their avenues of making money impacted. Then they actually do get involved. But again, or at least not involved, they get uh, agitated, as I, my friend would we, we say. We have seen that in our economy here. We have seen when the rich have been 
um, either taxed more or do not have the resources coming in to buy their luxury items, then the merchant gets are, are hurting. Yep. Yeah, I saw, saw it last week in the stock market with, uh, <laughs> with uh, the group mm -hmm. of small investors uh, right. shorting uh, or cutting off the shorting, shorting off the shorting yeah, yeah. Of, of going too early. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, it's it, you know, you, you see the yacht industry everything, yeah. and you really feel sorry for them. Yeah. Well, but, and again, that, that pushes things around and it, it, it's where it, the economy moves and but this is one of the things where yeah it's good that the economy moves but then there's also the question of what do we do to make the economy move and oh well yeah that labor is really cheap in China there's no reason because they really have no option about what they're oh yeah so we have a group of people out here now who do not want wealthy people. Mm -hmm. But those wealthy people are the ones that are probably or in some form or another paying their salaries, for, <laughs> you know, making the world go around. It, it, they don't, somehow or another, they don't understand how if, if somebody has money, a great deal of them spend that money um, whatever makes them happy. I, I have found, and this is just my observation, that, that people really don't understand economics and money. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you're, you're involved with running a small business, so you, you, you get some of that, but it, it's, what was it? Yeah, I, the government can be included in that. <laughs> well, the, the realities of just how you how you manage stuff and how you, you create what comes in and what comes out and um, okay so uh, a side note I you know y'all know that I like sports and uh, there I, I pay for an online sports newspaper called the Athletic because they have really good writers for for the English Premier League and and the Bears writers are really good the Cubs writers are miserable. And, and they've been doing nothing but complain this offseason about how the Cubs aren't spending more money to buy more free agents because the owners are so wealthy and the value of the club has gone up, so why don't they just spend that money? I'm like, do you realize that the value of the club is only there if they sell it? It's not liquid money to spend? Well, I mean, and they charge so much to, to sit at, at Wrigley and the concessions are so high, they should spend that money to buy some more play. Do you realize there were no tickets sold the last year? So all that money that they charge, they don't have any of that. That's why they're not, and, and every piece, it doesn't matter what it is, and they should be spending more on free agents. <laughs> and, 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 and I can, I can envision my, my high school economy teacher pulling his hair out trying to talk to this person. Then I realized they probably never got basic economics. Yeah, and, and we weren't required to take money management or investment management classes, so you would really like to put those people in business for a while. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I was also talking with uh, one of Celia's cousins who, who's younger and uh, he was lamenting uh, uh, the lack of home ec type stuff in, in school. And yeah, some of the best classes I had in, in high school were the home economics stuff. So, But I'm sure people will learn to pass their standardized tests much more proficiently now, and that's all that's important. <clears throat> and Jerry, if you want to do an Alaskan cruise, you can't do that now until... 2022 because Canada won't let those ships go into their port. So all those cities along that along inner passage coast. that I went to, oh. none of those are going to get any income like all those cruise ships took in and out of there because we must have stopped at seven ports. Right. Yeah. I think so I that's mean, we stopped that thing. That, five it's really a, yeah. Five or six. Yeah. Yeah. 
There goes, I know you were going to surprise Barb with a cruise. Oh, we, we, went, we, went, we, had, we went on a cruise up there three years ago. Okay. Forget a cruise. Didn't you actually like drag her all the way up to Alaska to live there? I mean, that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, she came willingly. <laughs> she was in love. It's <laughs> amazing what that does love. to you. <laughs> this yeah. is why the Greeks considered love to be a form of madness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the, so I, I do find it interesting just to see that you do have this this commentary on on the economic reality of of the time and of the world and and the acknowledgement that people will engage with wickedness for the sake of profit. And they will lament profit going away. And, and it, it's sad because if you look at that list, those are a lot of awesome, cool things, but they're not being delighted in. They're simply objects of commerce. And, and it, it's a disappointment. John at this time was just actually lamenting on ba Babylon that was not e existing at this time. At this time, when he wrote, Babylon this. is the woman. Woman, is Babylon. the emblem of evil. Yeah. Babylon also gets used as code word for Rome. Okay. As, as, but I don't think it's just Rome. I think it's always the emblem of earthly power. And and the point is, the earthly power will always fail. So it, it it's it is Babylon, but it's more than Babylon. It, it's I was looking at a, I, I saw another article that was talking about the, uh, the shifting of, of American ideals. How uh, if you went back 220 years ago, Boston was the, the center of the American ideal, especially like in the time of the Revolutionary War, we're all Bostonians. And then for a, a while it had been Chicago, like in the beginning of the 20th century. You, you wanted to be like Chicago, the city of broad shoulders. That set the ethos. And the, uh, I think it was Neil Postman who, who pointed this out and said, yeah, now we've basically become Vegas. It's all glitz and glamour. That's, that's what America has become, and we're, we're less for it. But that, that's almost the emblem of Babylon here. So. All right. Uh, let's look on. Uh, 17b through 20. This one I thought was fascinating. If someone could read that for us. And all shipmasters and all their crews and sailors and whoever works upon the sea from a distance stood and seeing the smoke of her burning, they cried out saying, who was like that great city? And they threw dirt upon their heads and wailing and sorrowing, they cried out saying, woe, woe to the great city in which by her luxury were made rich all who had ships upon the sea. For in one hour she hath been turned into a wilderness. Rejoice over her, O heavens, and the holy ones, and the apostles, and the prophets. For God has given judgment for you against her. What is interesting is now we get the sailors. Um, what do you think of when you think of sailors? Are they generally thought of as the highest and most moral of people? Mm, square <laughs> like a sailor. Right, right. And we, we, we have... Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, generally, if you go to any uh, coastal town, are the docks the, 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 the greatest, most moral place around? No. I, so we, we even today have this image of sailors being the, the at best, shifty. And, and that held true in the ancient world as well. That, that same idea was in. In fact, it was worse if you were of a Jewish background. Why? One of the things that, that's important to remember for, for Jewish culture, especially in the Old Testament. All right. So here you have Egypt, and here you have Jerusalem, or Israel, all that. You've got the mountain range here. And then on the coast, who lives on the coast here? The Philistines. The Philistines were sea people. They were related to, well, if you go over here, you get the Phoenicians, and you get uh, 
Carthage and all that, they're all related people. Uh, in fact, uh, they were the cause of the, the slavery of the, of the Israelites in Egypt till Egypt gets conquered by the Sea Peoples, the Hyksos. And they're, they're Semitic. So they're, they're likened to the, the Jewish people, but they're the Sea, the coastal people. And, they ha and, and the Israelites were basically mountain folk. Because what do you do? You can go hide in them. The Israelites, by and large, did not like the sea. Because what does God do with the sea? Open it up. <laughs> the sea is fundamentally dangerous. It's where God can go and smite you. Yeah, we've got the flood, we've got the Red Sea. There's lots of destruction by water. Let's not go there. But what do you have for, for sailors? You have Jonah. What, what happens with the sailors in the story of Jonah? So Jonah hops the ship, he's supposed to go north, he hops the ship west, and the storm rises, and what do the sailors figure out? They figure out Jonah's, Jonah's the culprit for the sea being, uh, or for God uh, causing the sea to... And, and Jonah says, throw me overboard. And what do the sailors do? No, we're, we're not going to kill you. That, that, we'll, we'll try other things, so they throw all the wares over. No, nope, it's still not doing. So they agree to throw Jonah over, but they pray to God. Then they hold this knot against us. They cast him over. It flattens. It, it storms stop. And what do they do? They worship the Lord. So, so even in the story of Jonah, you have the the sailors who actually are more moral and faithful than than many that you would expect. And what do you have here? They're the ones who mourn, and what they, they see what's going on, they say, Rejoice over her, O heavens, and holy ones and apostles and prophets. For God is giving you judgment for you against her. They recognize the, the, the activity of God, the, the truth of what is going on. And so it, it's just this odd thing that you, you wouldn't expect, but it does actually happen in the scriptures. And of course, are there other sailors that end up being emblems of faith? Well, the disciples. The disciples. See, this is one of the things where, where we think of the disciples being fishermen. If you were a first century Palestinian living in that area, if you were a nice first century Jewish person, to be a fisherman, you would have thought they were slightly off. You, you didn't do that. That, that was... That was like one of those jobs on dirty jobs or that, that you wouldn't want to do. I, it, it, it was just sort of, because it, 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 it's dealing with that place of threat and danger. It'd be like, yeah, I, I clean up nuclear sites. <laughs> it, 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 there'd be something eerie about it. Um, also, as a side note, um, when people say, oh, the disciples were uneducated, no. No. When the scripture talks about them not being educated, it meant they were not formally trained in rabbinical schools. It didn't mean that they were simpletons. Do you know how you can, can tell they weren't simpletons? They ran successful businesses. And do you know who doesn't run a successful business? Simpletons who don't know anything. That, that, I, I remember my dad getting on people in, in Nebraska. He, he shows up to Nebraska and and uh, couple of the, the farmers there were trying to do the oh shucks we're just simple farmers and my dad wait wait you know biology and you run a million dollar business don't try to tell me this oh aw shucks I don't know what I'm doing I'm just stupid no if you were stupid you'd be working someone else's land so don't even try that <laughs> the guy backed up and grinned a bit but <laughs> but but again so you this is just a really neat emblem of, of who shows up here. And they're the people who you think would be more shifty in terms of who gets the respect. Kings and merchants tend to get more respect than the sailors, and yet who sees the reality better? Who understands what's going on? The sailors. 
who actually sees what's going on and repents? The sailors. What do they do? They throw dust on their head. Gee, is there a time when we think about throwing dust on our heads? That's coming up in like 10 days. It, it, it's the sign of repentance. And, and so you have, you do have, oh, look, there, there are some people who react well. And it, it's just a, a beautiful setup. You get up the, uh, what looked to be grand turned out to be the wilderness, the abode of Satan. Okay, now I'm, now I'm slightly at a loss for words and rambling. But are there any other thoughts on, on that? Do you see how there's that, that contrast there that plays out? Sailors in the, uh, in the Bible are, are interesting. We're, uh, we're, we're inland folks here in Illinois. Even with the Great Lakes, they're, they're mild compared to when you get to the ocean and stuff like that. And, and frankly, here we're pretty far away from the Great Lakes. It's, uh, I don't do a lot of seafood because I never live by the sea. But it's an interesting thing to, to be around the, the naval culture. So, all right. Um, any other thoughts there? Then let's, if someone could finish the chapter for us, 21 through 24. And a mighty angel seized a stone like a mighty millstone, and he threw it into the sea, saying, Thus violently will Babylon, the great city, be cast down, and she will be found no more. And the sound of harpers and musicians and flutists and trumpeters will no more be heard in you, and all craftsmen of any craft will no more be found in you, and the sound of the mill will no more be heard in you, and the light of the lamp will no more shine in you, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will no more be heard in you, for your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your drugging all the nations were deceived. And in her the blood of the prophets and the saints was found, and of all who have been slaughtered upon the earth. All right. Now, this is one that I thought was incredibly unique. Now, you hear the word millstone thrown into the ocean. Does that strike up anything for you? Well, those who would cause a child to be to sin uh, would be better for them. But to have a millstone cast around. That's right. Th this is the image that, that gets used for the better punishment for people who lead people astray. What does Babylon do? Leads people astray. But then, this is dovetailing off of Genesis chapter 4 in an incredible, profound way. When was the last time any of you read Genesis chapter 4? What happens in Genesis chapter 4? Genesis 3 is the fall. What happens immediately after the fall? Cain and Abel. So, so we get the story of Cain and Abel. So you get the innocent blood being shed, and my punishment's too great to bear. But then the chapter continues. Let, let, me, let me go on. So Cain gets his mark, and this is Genesis 4, 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he had built the city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Arad, Arad fathered Mahulel. Mahulahel fathered Methuselah, Methuselah fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The one was named Ada, the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jabal, who is the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and fife. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of brawn and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech is seventy-sevenfold. So what you have there is a, a beautiful depiction of, of the descendants of Cain. And what are they? They're the folks who do all the city stuff. And they, they do the music, the, the working, the smithing. And what do you have listed right here? Thus violently will Babylon the great be cast down. Sound of harpers and musicians and trumpeters, craftsmen and any craftsmen will be more be found. This is, this is the undoing of Genesis 4. Because what happens? 
we will we'll do things our way. And great. Um, I'm not saying all cities are bad, but, but generally, uh, most cities are set up with the great promise that we will, we will have civil engineers design the perfect society, and this will be the way things should be. And what happens in cities? How do they turn out? There's always the high end and then the low end as far as economics go. And the, the, the promise of the cities to, to be great and wonderful aren't always what they're cracked up to be. In fact, is there another story from, from Genesis that, that really highlights that above all others? The false promise of the city where we'll do things our way. Sodom and Gomorrah. I was thinking earlier than that, but that's another example of, of cities that have gone astray. Big Tower. The Tower of Babel. And what are we talking about here being fallen? Do, 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 you, do you see why I, I like to think of Revelation as being a, an end cap? It, it really is playing off of a lot of these themes from the Old Testament. And this passage here is really playing off of a lot of Old Testament stuff that we might not think of because, again, how often do we read the genealogies of Cain in Genesis 4? If I were to say, name me your favorite parts of Scripture, how many parts of Scripture would have to be named before we got to Cain's genealogy? But, but yet one of the first things we get in the Bible, and there's a reason for it. It sets the stage for what goes on. Um, other thing of, of note here. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your drugging all the nations were deceived. You know the Greek word for drugging here. It's pharmakia, from which we get the word pharmacist. And, uh, and actually, that, that word for pharmakia can also refer to magic. Why? You're mixing a potion, and it does things. So it, it, it can be used to, to describe magical stuff. That there, there's been a, a strong tie between drug use and witchcraft. Oh, gee, what are we finding out? Yeah, the same type of stuff going on. So it, it but, but what is happening is Justice in God's time. That that punishment is meted out when God realizes it is the appropriate time for punishment to be sent forth. And and, and it really is if you're getting if you're getting all the, the impacts of Cain and his wickedness, if you're getting that wrapped up, because Babylon is is fallen because of the martyrs. Well, who do you have with just a race? Who do you have with Cain? You've got Abel. So that all this this is the image of all the wickedness of the of the history of creation being dealt with, being cleansed, being being not cleansed, but cleaned up after, being being punished, being brought to an end. And in her, the blood of the prophets and the saints was found, and all have been slaughtered upon the earth. What does God say to Cain? After he asked where your brother Abel is, I heard what? The voice of his blood crying from the ground. Do you see how this is just, this is, not, not to put too fine a point on it, but how many chapters do we have left in the book? Four. Or if they, they would have thought of it this way. But you can think of it almost as like the, the zipper being opened and closed. Now we're now we're getting things back. Because really I, I, I will finish with this as an idea. 
if you want to think about what the life of the world to come will look like, will be like, it's going to be more Eden restored. It is going to be human beings enjoying the gift that God has given. We may have clues. I don't know. If we don't, I don't care. But, but, but it, it, it's that sense of humans in their body not dying and enjoying God's creation. That, that's the goal. That's the restoration, the new heavens and the new earth that we're going to, to see played out the rest of the book. It is a back to what it should have been. And so it's almost like we're rewinding and you're seeing everything being rewound and undone. That wickedness brought to an end. Because we're right to the end of the book. And we're going to see the happy ending coming up. So, great playing off of the Old Testament here. So, um, just to look to where we're going. Uh, chapter 19 finishes off the, the divine judgment. Um, Chapter 20, the first half of 21, gets the final judgment. And then the book ends with the happy ending for the second half of chapter 20. So we really are wrapping things up. So any other final questions or comments before we pause, before we start a new chapter next time? I, I do think... One of the things I've always been told was that the reason why Revelation is so hard to read is because we don't understand the Old Testament enough. We, we don't have a... People jump to Revelation before they've got the grounding in the Old Testament to get it. And, and I really think this chapter highlights a lot of that because it really is almost doing the Old Testament's greatest hits. In, in, or or in, in Old Testament distilled down. And that's what it's playing off of. And if you don't get that this is commentary upon what went on in the Old Testament, that it's, that it's not viewing it as the Old Testament, but it's closing up the scriptures that have gone before, then you don't get it. It's not, it's not detached from the Old Testament. It's just living there. So. All right. Well, I would, well what's... Uh, what's behind? Is, is there a is there a theme behind groups or denominations or whatever that purposely don't see that or are unwilling to accept that? I mean, I mean, there's there's obviously those out there who who look at revelations in a different light. Revelation, revelation, yeah. Yes. Well, one, it, it became. Some of it is just <clears throat> ignorance. I, I, I really yeah, like not understanding the right. Old Testament. Yeah. Or, or not understanding the Old Testament in terms of it's the story of the redemption of God's people and the Messiah, Christ Jesus. Um, but one of the things that has come up to you, and some of, some of it is just ignorance, but the other thing is, I'm going to give you one of the arch villains of church history. Are you ready? Marcion. And Marcion lived in the second century. I mean, he was very early on. One of the arch heretics. And he actually did something that, that really had more of an impact on, on how people read the Bible than we think about it today. Um, he basically rejected the entirety of the Old Testament and most of the epistles and basically all the Gospels except Luke and then the writing of Paul. And basically his argument was God of the Old Testament that's presented there. No, that's not really God because he's mean and spiteful. Not like the kind, loving God in Jesus. Gee, do we hear anything today even about people talking and complaining about the mean, angry God of the Old Testament compared to the kind that that's that, that's the roots and seeds of Marcionite, Marcionism still popping up. And, and so I think sometimes there, there is that disconnect where we just, we can almost think of God in the Old Testament as being mean and we want to 
to stay away from it so we don't get as enmeshed in the Old Testament. Whereas, really, the New Testament is replete with, with God being strong and the strength of God. And Jesus is not a weak one. And in fact, in a few weeks, we're going to get in less uh, the, the house divided text. Jesus casting out demons. Oh, he cast out demons by the eligible. No. Um, a strong man guards his palace, his goods are safe, but then what happens? The stronger man comes. That's Jesus. This is, sing my tongue the glorious battle. And so, I think there, there's almost been sort of a, that distancing from the idea of judgment at all, which is really kind of strange when you think about Jesus taking on judgment upon himself. So, but that, I think, kind of plays into where it's at a distance or it, it's, I don't know, now I'm rambling with it, but does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. That we don't handle the Old Testament well. There are scriptures, they belong to us. And you can't understand the Old Testament apart from Christ Jesus. But even you could Ananias and Sapphira, I mean, that, that was... I mean, uh, <laughs> so don't fall asleep in my sermon, and don't lie about your offering. All right. Well, that's the, what would Jesus do? Well, you know, uh, whipping everyone in church is an option, so just be careful about saying that you want pastor to be more Jesus. -like. I'm just saying. So. All right, let's close up with prayer, and then I'm going to be ready. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great love you have shown to us by winning us redemption your son Christ Jesus and delivering us from the, the present evils of this age and also preparing us for the life of the world to come. See us safely there, be with us this evening in worship and grant that we might join with the voices of all the uh, angels and archangels who have gone before us in praising your name. This we pray in the name of your son Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You don't tug on Superman's cape. So, so, good. Bye, everybody. We're, we're